Καλημέρα σας. We are going to start with the first session, uh, AI uh, for vision. Uh, and you see that vision is really a field that has been greatly impacted by AI. So to uh, make a very, very short introduction to the session, uh, let me say that the ability to perceive and semantically annotate the world comes natural to us as humans. This is not the same for machines. How and what do machines see and how can one make sense of this information? Since computers were invented, the field of computer vision has tried to, has tried to answer these questions. Um, and uh, um, today we are going to hear from leading researchers in the field on how the field has progressed from object recognition in images to 3D scene recognition and reconstruction uh, to uh, the development of systems that are able to perceive aspects of human presence through processing and analysis of images and video to recent advances in building embodied systems able of continual learning for perception, action and language grounding. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say anything more. I want to introduce our first speaker. Professor Antonis Argyros is uh, with the Computer Science Department of the University of Crete and uh, an, a researcher at the Institute of Computer Science at the Fourth Foundation in Heraklion, Crete. In, uh, in Crete. Uh, he received his degrees from the Department of Computer Science in Heraklion and, and uh, did his postdoctoral work at KTH. Um, you'll hear about his work, so I'm not going to say a lot, but for many years he has been pioneering approaches in uh, image motion and tracking with emphasis on human body pose. Uh, he has published a, a huge number of papers, more than 200 papers, has given many uh, invited lectures and keynote talks at international events and universities, and I would like to ask you to welcome him to the podium. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, many thanks, uh, Lydia, for uh, the kind introduction. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to be here with you today and to talk to you about uh, our work on uh, human-centered computer vision. Uh, this is work that, as Lydia said, has been carried out at the Computer Science Department, University of Crete, and also at the Institute of Computer Science uh, at Ford. So we, uh, we all know Uh, do I control this? Okay, great. So, um, we all know that uh, uh, computer vision is about developing technical systems for, with visual perception uh, capabilities. Uh, so, uh, as Lydia said, uh, if we are uh, seeing an image like this, uh, humans can uh, answer a lot of interesting questions. So, for example, we can identify the domes, we can um, reason about how far they are, we can uh, count how many steps there are, and we can also assign labels to the scene. So, we can say, for example, that this is about an outdoor scene, and also that it is uh, taken from the caldera of Santorini. Uh, so, a word is more than a thousand words, actually, and uh, an image is uh, more than a thousand words. And essentially, if one studies all these questions, he will soon come to the conclusion that uh, vision is about, for humans, is about uh, measuring quantities and assessing qualities about the environment. So, essentially, for, um, in, uh, when we talk about human-centered computer vision, uh, what really changes is that the subject of, 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 of observation are human, is humans. So essentially, and following the aim of computer vision, what we are trying to do is to measure quantities about humans, for example, build detailed 3D models of their body, hands, and faces, or assess qualities, meaning that uh, we want to identify humans, recognize their actions, emotions, and so forth. 
Um, so, um, in, um, in this uh, field of uh, research, um, uh, we have carried out a work, research work, which I would uh, place into a two-dimensional space. In the one axis, I would put what is actually observed, and this ranges from body parts to human bodies and collections of people on the one side. And then on the vertical axis, I would put what is actually inferred about the observed scene. And this goes from low-level information like motion and geometry up to a higher level semantic information. So in this two-dimensional space, one might identify some isos of interesting topics and problems. Like, for example, how can we um, infer motion and geometry about body parts and, and, and objects? Uh, we can also question whether uh, we can track the human uh, pose and uh, shape. Um, we can uh, see whether we can uh, understand gestures and emotions by observing body parts or uh, even uh, recognize actions and activities. And we soon realize that uh, essentially uh, humans do not perform in isolation but in interaction with their environment. So studying this interaction is very interesting and important. Further up, we might want to assess the quality of uh, the actions observed or even try to go into the future and predict in intentions of humans. Um, at the end, we might also be tempted to uh, solve these problems not for a single human, but for groups of people. Um, of course, this two-dimensional space I mentioned is quite simplistic. I mean, there are several other interesting dimensions in the problem. So, for example, the time dimension is very important because we want to understand things for the past and the present, but also predict the future. Um, also, context is very important because measurements and observations in vision are heavily context dependent. So the same type of information has completely different meaning depending on the context it is observed. Last but not least, um, um, it happens that different cameras give you different input and then this input might affect the complexity of the problems to be solved. So taking this also into account plays a very important role. So, um, are these problems interesting? For sure they are. Uh, why so? Because, um, I mean, humans can solve them. Uh, so, we are curious and ambitious uh, towards, you know, uh, building machines with similar capabilities. But at the more practical level, um, we understand that cameras, computing systems and humans are everywhere. Therefore, uh, if we develop seeing machines, machines with human perception capabilities, then we can basically impact each and every aspect of uh, human uh, life. So, um, we have interesting and impactful problems. The question now is whether they are easy ones. And uh, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, they are not. Uh, and the reason is that um, we extract, we want to extract a lot of information out of images, which is, uh, needs to be solved with relatively poor observations. So what can be go wrong? Uh, there are several things that can go wrong. Uh, first of all, similar things might appear different. Uh, different things might appear similar. Uh, there might be missing information, for example, due to occlusions. Or there might, there might be too much information because there is uh, visual clutter. Uh, there might be already, I, I mentioned, context-dependent interpretations. And also, there is a very big variability in, in spatial scales. So you might have an image of a crowd in 100 by 100 image patch, or you might have a megapixel image on the, uh, uh, on the fingertip of one of your fingers. Um, Temporal scales also uh, uh, are very diverse because the eye blinking takes milliseconds and other human activity might take uh, quite, uh, quite longer. Uh, on top of, of all these, different applications require different accuracies. So, for example, in an application it might be sufficient to say that this human is very close to the car in the order of centimeters or meters, but then if you, do, if you are doing visual guided uh, surgery, it might be that you need to basically estimate the position of the fingers uh, of the human hand in sub-millimeter accuracy. So, in this uh, domain, which is uh, interesting, impactful and difficult, which means that uh, there is a huge potential for research, we have done um, uh, some work over the, the last uh, several years 
And I'm going to be presenting you uh, some of such results with emphasis on what we do and why we do it, mostly than, rather than how. Uh, and this is intentional because in a, a diverse audience like this, in an event like this, I think that uh, this is the most useful thing to do. Uh, still, I will be more than happy to discuss with you the technical details of uh, the presented the techniques during this workshop or uh, at any uh, other future opportunity. So, we start with the bottom left part of our uh, research map, uh, and then we go into the problem of observing human hands uh, in isolation. So, early work started with um, techniques that uh, process two-dimensional images and actually want to track body parts in these two-dimensional images. Uh, the, the result which we are mostly known for is the lifting of this two-dimensional information into 3D. So we have techniques that basically permit a camera system to observe the hand in much detail and infer the three-dimensional location of each and every joint of the human uh, that moves in front of a, of a camera using depth information. Uh, following that, there has been work on side problems which are nevertheless very important for practical reasons. So, for example, the previous method assumes that the, known of the, the model of the human hand, its shape, is known to the system, right? But this is not a practical, a practical uh, assumption because, of course, not all human hands are the same. So what we developed is techniques that online are the, have the capability to, to basically um, adapt the hand model to its proper dimensions, as uh, this happens on the fly. Uh, even um, more recent results, uh, what uh, they, they managed to do is to get rid of the temporal requirements of the requirement for temporal uh, processing of the images, and in a single frame, without depth information, can infer the three-dimensional pose of the hands of, uh, of that particular uh, actor. And, and so this makes, uh, take, uh, makes the, the, the whole thing much more uh, practical and, 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 and useful. Going to phases, um, with similar techniques, we have the possibility to um, uh, track the pose of the human hand, a head, or facial features, as you can see in these videos, or um, more recent work by Tassos Russos, a colleague at, at, at Forth, um, um, has shown that we can densely reconstruct the, the facial, uh, the, 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 the face of a human and actually use this for what we call um, uh, reenactment, face reenactment, meaning that we can transfer the motion of a certain face to, to another one. Um, Moving to the side about human body uh, uh, pose uh, estimation, um, again, our first approach uh, was a technique for uh, estimating a skeletal model of a human body um, in difficult conditions, meaning that uh, essentially uh, this operates in under occlusions, it operates, it reinitializes automatically if uh, camera moves abruptly, uh, it handles motion blur, uh, it, it, it handles all these uh, nasty problems that you can find in real world life and you don't see that easily in, 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 in data sets, in, in test data sets. Um, 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 later work tried to use neural networks in order to generalize these uh, solutions to uh, the situation where we observe color images only without depth information um, under the same uh, restrictive and, 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 and practical assumptions. Um, so you see that um, and, and one of the advantages of this uh, new approach is again the, the fact that uh, um, is um, uh, tolerant to, to occlusions uh, and to uh, also integrates the skeletal model of the human body with uh, a, a hand articulation and runs in, in real time in uh, commodity hardware, in a single uh, CPU uh, thread of a, of, of a conventional computer. Even more recent work tries to estimate um, the three-dimensional, uh, um, the three-dimensional, um, oops,
the three dimensional shape of the human uh, besides the uh, besides uh, the pose is it possible uh, that we go again into uh, presenter mode Okay, thank you. And if I can go back to presenter mode, apologies for that. Uh, so you see that uh, this is uh, this is possible to um, this is this is possible to um, it is possible to estimate also the shape of the human body besides uh, its uh, its pose. Um, now, um, if we, uh, as I said, interactions are very interesting and very uh, and and very informative. So uh, again, in um, in, in, a, in the first uh, set of uh, results, uh, we exploited two-dimensional information. And then the goal is to, infer, is to transform a, a number of frames into temporal events, which is very, very useful and very important for interpreting the visual content. Um, later work uh, in, uh, addressed increasingly more difficult problems. So we lifted again the information uh, on 3D by studying, for example, the interaction of a hand with a single rigid object or uh, of the hand with another hand, which is much more complicated, or with, uh, in the case of several hands, that interact in the, with the environment in a natural way. And uh, in this uh, last scenario, it is interesting that uh, we have so accurate information that it takes uh, a very simple logic to understand what Nikos is typing on his keyboard uh, exactly because of the accuracy uh, that uh, the information is in inferred in 3D. Um, but of course, a large number of rigid or articulated objects is not as complex as it can get because uh, the world is even more complex. So, for example, it is very interesting and useful to be able to deal with shape deformations and uh, uh, study the interaction of hands with deformable uh, objects, some of which might also undergo uh, topological changes because, for example, somebody tears or, 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 or cuts them. Um, and once again, um, the uh, objects that are deformable, it's not uh, the worst that can happen because there are also uh, objects that are um, essentially uh, transparent. And for those objects, uh, our uh, vision hypothesis do not, uh, do not uh, uh, work anymore. So we need different technologies, different techniques in order to be able to reconstruct uh, objects made of, made of glass of, uh, that are transparent, translucent, refractive, etc. Um, again, if uh, we have transparent or translucent objects, we do have some kind of information. What is uh, uh, even more difficult is to try to uh, uh, deal with the interaction of a hand uh, with objects which are unknown to the system. That are basically um, not much knowledge about them. So what we tried is to, to have an interaction, a, te a technique that essentially studies and uh, uh, interprets the interaction of human hands with unknown objects, objects for which there is no prior model to the system, uh, with a technique that at the end enables what? Enables the accurate tracking of the human hands and at the same time uh, the development of a, um, a fairly accurate photorealistic model of the manipulated hand which was priorly uh, 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 not known to the system. Now, uh, all these problems work on the basis of some uh, uh, optimization technique uh, which takes into account constraints that are uh, scenario dependent. And what would uh, basically uh, ways to unify all these uh, constraints into one common um, uh, thing. And essentially what is really uh, useful to consider is physics, because the common denominator of this kind of interaction scenarios is essentially physics. So we managed to integrate um, uh, physics into the perception process. Physics is used there in the form of a physics-based simulator, which 
uh, basically produces physically plausible interpretations of the scene or hypotheses about what is going on in the scene, a fact that gives us the possibility to track very complex scenarios. So what you see here is that the hand interacts with an object which pushes another object inside of which there is a hidden cap. So here is the interpretation that goes on in the system, but vi uh, the visibility of the of the ball is is is, is he the ball is hidden to the to the camera uh, because it is inside the cup. And by employing physics, it is possible that essentially we can track and maintain the reasonable hypothesis that the ball cannot escape the uh, the walls of that particular glass. Talking about uh, physics, uh, it is also important in several applications to be able to estimate latent uh, things like the forces. So a hand manipulates an object, it exerts certain forces at the contact points on the object. Can we measure them uh, without uh, just by, by looking at this? And in a series of experiments, we showed that uh, some estimation of this, uh, the estimation of some of these forces is, is uh, possible with fairly uh, high accuracy. Um, moving on in the interpretation part, um, again, you will not be surprised that uh, first uh, efforts tried to uh, recognize uh, what gestures and actions and activities uh, based on two-dimensional features, later work uh, capitalized on the much richer three-dimensional uh, information that we can extract of images. In all cases, the bottom line is that we don't talk about uh, interpretation of uh, uh, recognition of well-segmented video parts, but rather about online segmentation and recognition of, uh, of actions that might happen in the context of unmodeled actions. In some other situations, what we uh, basically are trying to do is not to assign uh, labels uh, of actions in particular videos, but what we are trying to do is to uh, segment vi videos on the basis of qualities and characteristics of uh, actions. So, for example, there are actions that are repetitive, like uh, the, uh, the gymnastics that this guy is doing in the video, right? So, can we uh, basically segment uh, the video into the parts of it which contain the repetitive action uh, from, the, from the rest of the video? Uh, this... Uh, uh, technique addresses this particular problem. And in the same spirit, one might go even further and ask even more complicated questions, like, for example, how can we co-segment uh, actions that appear in two different videos? So the idea here is that uh, we, have two, uh, we have two videos, uh, as shown here, um, um, and then um, without knowing anything about the actor, uh, we want to see, to find, and align the common actions of these two videos. So we know nothing about the actor. We don't know how many common actions uh, and activities are on these videos. We don't know anything about the order of the actions. We just want, at the end, to come up with commonalities which are basically aligned. And the actions might uh, uh, happen by different actors in different styles and in different durations. As soon as we have such a component, we can uh, use it for even more complex problems. Uh, so, for example, we can use that for um, uh, assessing the uh, video similarity, uh, the similarity of video. So, in this particular scenario here, what we have is, uh, uh, in this example, we have three videos. The leftmost is a, a video in which somebody steals his cup of coffee. On the rightmost, we have somebody who brings cere uh, uh, drops cereals in, in, in his bowl, and in the middle video, there's another guy that steers uh, a bowl with a spatula and then drops some liquid into, in, into, this, into this bowl. So we want to develop something that not only compares quantitatively the similarity of these videos uh, based on the entities and the activities that happen in there, but also to explain us that uh, video A is similar to video to the, the, the leftmost is uh, similar to the central video because they both involve some steering operation, regardless of the visual uh, dissimilarity of the involved objects. And then 
uh, also explained to us that uh, what is similar between video C and video B is the fact that they both uh, show someone, someone dropping something into a container. Uh, applications, as the, run, as the time runs, um, important applications in robotics. Uh, assume that we have a video... I have taken a quarter mile button and prevented it in the sous vide overnight. Um, we have, we have um, somebody uh, preparing a toast in this video, and then what we would uh, hope for is to have this as a knowledge source that enables a robot to basically repeat the task. Uh, of course, the robot requires a lot of other uh, knowledge sources, but obviously, uh, knowing ha ha the visual part, the visual part is, is really very important. In another scenario, um, the robot uh, has to the robot has to transfer to collaborate with Alexandros so, so that they together uh, carry something somewhere else. Okay, and but for for this to be achieved, the robot has to know the motion of Alexandros so to keep up with his motion. It has to know where Alexandros grasps the object because then it can grasp it complementarily. Um, and it also has to understand a, a sign that uh, Alexandros makes to the robot to signal the end of the, of the process. So a lot of visual information that is required to solve this uh, very interesting task. And other applications which involve, uh, um, involve uh, robots um, uh, assisting humans doing fitness exercises, or uh, other robots in the form of uh, workers who uh, basically uh, detect the human presence, detect human behaviors, and inform their users while they are, they are uh, um, um, moving uh, in, in, in space. Um, in the, in the um, topic of healthcare, important applications in um, uh, gait analysis and uh, rehabilitation assessment, or uh, situations where um, cameras monitor the presence, the humans that are working in an assembly line in an industrial environment and safeguard them from taking, uh, you know, poses that are uh, stressed and therefore might harm them. Um, last but not least, in the domain of uh, digital uh, culture, um, um, techniques for monitoring uh, human motion in order to present, to preserve and document uh, 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 crafts, and also development of different types of uh, nice uh, human computer interaction. Um, just to give you a few examples, uh, particularly the middle one, where the idea is that there's a camera overlooking a scene and observes the interaction of humans with uh, some uh, cardboards. The idea uh, here is that uh, by monitoring this interaction, these cardboards, these plain cardboards, are transformed into a intelligent multimedia displays. Um, all these have been uh, 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 carried out uh, in collaboration with a lot of, with a great, with a big research network. Uh, we are grateful to them for the uh, in, uh, inspiration and the collaboration. Um, there has also been a lot of uh, generous uh, support for, uh, from uh, EU and national projects. Uh, we are again get, uh, uh, grateful for this. Uh, one particular mention on the I See Humans uh, project, which is an HFRI project which did not only support um, uh, research, but also the development of a laboratory space that uh, uh, features a, a state-of-the-art Vicon motion capture system and a, a big computational infrastructure. Data and uh, computing power are uh, imperative for our research. Uh, last, but certainly not least, a big thanks to the group. Uh, these are the people uh, that contributed to what you have seen. It's actually their work, and I am grateful to them for their devotion, motivation, and uh, enthusiasm. And uh, a big thanks to them, but also a, a big thanks to all of you for being here today and attending this talk. Thank you very much. Okay. Donnie, 
uh, you mentioned physics at some point. Do you uh, mean that you are solving kinematics? Um, what we are actually doing is the following, is that we have a model of the scene. We have a model of the entities involved in the scenario we are talking about, like, you know, models of hands, models of objects. Uh, we simulate, uh, we do simulations, uh, we use a, a physics-based simulator, which basically runs different scenario. And then we optimize the interpretation of the scene on the basis of this hypothesis. So, uh, according to different in, uh, scenario in the physics-based simulation, we obtain different physically plausible scenario, which then we can render and compare to what we actually observe. And uh, at the end of the, uh, of the day, what uh, the, the, the vision system re really reports is the parameters of the scenario that led to something in the physics simulator which is as close as possible to what it is actually observed by cameras. So th this is the way it works uh, and this is the way uh, in which um, this uh, framework not only gives some interpretation of what is going on but also guarantees that up to the uh, accuracy of the simulation process the solution sought is physically plausible which is quite important when these um, problems have to be solved to, uh, for robots to acquire you know, uh, information about the environment. Okay. We'll take one more question. Yes? Uh, in the next five to ten years, what would you and your group would find the most challenging to address and the most exciting to address? One we are looking into several problems. Um, the default is to try to push further state, the state of the art on the problems that I already mentioned. But there is also what I what I uh, what I'm really fascinated about is you know to to uh, try to integrate problems holistically. So I will I, I will mention two problems. One problem is to try to somehow unify. Uh, the spatial and temporal scales. So you might uh, have a camera that observes a human who comes, uh, you know, from uh, uh, quite a far distance, and then he appears to be, you know, a, a, a tiny patch of uh, 10 by 10 pixels, right? And then this guy might bring you his uh, 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 index finger in front of the camera, and then you observe the whole image covered by just... Uh, um, a, a, a small portion of, of, of his hand. So is it possible that all these huge spatial scales are simu simultaneously tracked and handled? All right. Let's thank Andonisi one more time. Thank you, thank, you thank, you. thank you very much. We are going to move to the second talk of the, the session, which will be given by Katerina Frangiadaki. Katerina is assistant professor in the machine learning department in Carnegie Mellon University. She received her undergraduate diploma from the electrical and computer engineering in the National Technical University of Athens and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She was a postdoc at UC Berkeley and Google after that. Uh, you'll hear a lot about her work. It's uh, um, um, amazing uh, how she's able to enable a few short learning and continual learning for perception, action, and language grounding. Um, I'm going to say that uh, Katerina has uh, received the Best PhD Thesis Award and uh, really all the uh, awards that are um, uh, geared towards uh, young investigators in the United States, the NSF Career Award, the AFA OSR Young Investigator Award and the DARPA Young Investigator Award. So with this, let us welcome Katerina. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lydia, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this workshop and for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, my work. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, the, so what I was uh, I was trying to think what to present today. So the overview is going to be as follows. M most of the talk is going to be 2023. 
uh, work and the, because I think the last year has been super revolutionary for computer vision with generative models really working and large language models also, you know, uh, showing these uh, incredible results. Uh, but I'll start with, uh, you know, what I'm most excited about, inductive, uh, 3D inductive biases for perception for autonomous vehicles and robots. And how can we scale up simulation to enable large scale skill, robot skill learning using generative models? Uh, how can LLMs help, uh, you know, embodied agents and robots and instructable systems? And I'm going to finish with open problems and what I'm I think it's extremely, you know, it's the most important thing to focus on uh, going forward. Uh, so our field for many years has addressed, uh, you know, perception as a fit forward labeling. You have the image, you have the pixels, and our goal is to assign labels to the visible pixels. And, and you see that this, um, despite the fact that, you know, many, many, you know, people are working on this problem and have made tremendous progress. Uh, in fact, this is a DETIC model from 2022, and it's pretty incredible that it figures out that this little triangle is a cat. Uh, you see that this is a very narrow definition of perception, right? So we don't just label what we see. It's all about what we don't see and what we infer. And what we infer is consistent with the pixels that, you know, have so much noise and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and occlusions, as uh, uh, Adonis mentioned as well. So it's all about inferring the 3D scene behind the picture. What you see here is the whole cat that is staying behind the fence, right? And, and the whole point of perception is to understand what happens in the scene as opposed to labeling the pixels with uh, semantic labels. Okay? And, you know, we're very also uh, inspired by neuroscientists that say that, you know, perception is inference problem. You try to infer using your priors the 3D scene representation that is consistent with your observations. Um, so being, let's say, inspired by this idea, our goal was the following, to start from whatever we see, the images, and build a 3D scene, a representation, which what you see here is this 3D grid, okay? Which essentially what it does is it lifts 2D images into a, you know, geometrically consistent feature space. You see here is just a 3D grid, you know, width by height, um, by depth, and by number of channels. So each one of those grid locations holds a feature vector that describes the appearance and geometry of the scene at that part. And what are you going to do with those feature vectors? Well, you're going to train them from your favorite downstream task, like object detection, pose estimation, uh, you know, uh, manipulation, what my robot should do, and, and so on. So our goal is, how can you use geometry and 3D to do better, uh, you know, perception of the scene behind uh, the 2D pixels? And just to give you an idea of how, you know, our model worked, uh, is you, the, the images come, so here is just the coffee machine, and there is, um, you're wor working around the coffee machine, and you see it from different viewpoints, and what you do is you featureize each image and lift it in 3D, and you use the camera calibration to combine those features across the multiple viewpoints. So you fuse the features, okay? And you make those 3D, geometrically consistent 3D feature maps. And, of course, you can supervise exactly what you do with the 2D models, 2D CNNs or transformers, what is the, you know, norm right now in computer vision. You can do exactly the same things with those models that jump from a 2D uh, perspective space to a 3D scene uh, space, okay? And the most exciting, though, is that going to 3D, instead of just using standard supervision from annotations of humans regarding where the objects are and what are their labels, you can actually self-supervise yourself. And you can self-supervise yourself by rendering these 3D feature representations and try to generate the images that you expect to see by moving around. So you self-supervise yourself by predicting the world. And indeed, the, the fact that, you know, the brain learns by prediction is a well-established fact now. The details is what matters, how this is done, how you can, uh, you know, maintain a probabilistic interpretation of what may happen, how can you handle multiple modes, and so on. Uh, now, this idea of geometric fusion of uh, 2D images actually is what happens nowadays in autonomous vehicles, okay? And, and here is a uh, one of our latest works, or one of those works in that, uh, you know, uh, vein, where you take the six cameras all around an autonomous vehicle, futurize them, you know, geometrically consistently aggregate their features, and predict a semantic map of the bird's eye view uh, for the car to drive on, okay? And, and, you know, our model does very well and outperforms our previous work, 
And the interesting thing is that in the Tesla AI day, you see here Andre Karpathy, which was the director of Tesla, they actually proposed a very similar model. Um, so they call it the vector space. So you know, Tesla is one of the leading companies in autonomous vehicles. What they do is they say, we don't need LiDAR. LiDAR sensors are expensive. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having LiDAR sensors to, to sense the depth of the scene. But what you do is you have an autonomous vehicle. You have cameras all around that vehicle. Like I think they have eight, eight cameras. And then what you do is you need to fuse their features and train to do the semantic labeling. And what you see on the left and on the right is the problem of just doing per image perception you know, infer the semantic labels and then fuse them into a 3D representation. And as you see, you have uh, duplicates of the road uh, everywhere and so on. You cannot drive from this type of representation. But while fusing the features in a geometrically meaningful way and then training your network actually gives you something that you can drive on. So they call this a vector space, which is exactly the same thing that, that uh, we're proposing. Um, Overall, I'm pretty excited about uh, the progress in the, you know, autonomous vehicles. Of course, you know, every year we say next year they're going to go on the road, next year going to go on the road, but actually, you know, that date is coming, okay? Perception is actually pretty much solved, uh, driven by what? Driven by this type of progress of 3D perception as well as enormous amount of money on labeling, uh, you know, scenes. Uh, Tesla has its own in-house labeling platform with their own trained labelers where, you know, the machine collaboratively with humans label scenes. So you don't label everything. You only label what the machine cannot interpret and see well yet. So I think this is uh, very interesting. So, so I say this is a domain where things are moving well. I mean, planning is still, uh, you know, we'll go to planning in later in the talk, but the planning part does have a lot of human component in there. And, uh, you know, the, the open problem there is in the planning part on deciding how the car should move, how can you go away from human engineers deciding if the nails rules and move it more and more and more towards end-to-end -to -end learned, uh, you know, uh, driving behavior. But, but, but we'll see this in a little bit. The, the perception part, I say it's a success. And the question is, okay, great, so we have a very successful robot, which is the autonomous vehicle that can see pretty well. Um, we did pay a lot of money for that, okay, because there is clearly a killer application of uh, autonomous vehicles. How can we do similar things for, for a general robot that manipulates scenes? And uh, things that, you know, companies are not interested yet because, I mean, arguably, you know, Manipulators entering our homes is going to take still some time. Okay, so 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 this is still a problem that is pretty much in the academic community. The question is how can we make progress? Well, I'll tell you about the work that you know we just uh, archived. Okay, uh, which is we call it Act 3D. So you act in the 3D space. So what happens is you have a robot that can assess its environment from multiple cameras that you know could know you know their calibration and is trying to execute the behavior and you have a language stack to tell you what to do here is probably stack the wine bottle to the middle of the rack okay so what we're going to do to, to, to be able to achieve this we're going to break this into key poses so key poses are important key frames where the velocity of the gripper uh, changes and, and so on so this is what we care to predict because interpolating between key poses is actually easy so that's the idea and so the Act 3D system takes these multi-view images, and by the way, this can totally be one view if you only have one camera, and that's okay, and predicts where the gripper should go. And again, in the next time step, again, predicts again where the gripper should go, and different activities have different number of keyframes. So short activities have few keyframes, and long activities have longer keyframes. And we're going to train the supervised from demonstrations. So the question is, so the person that can generalize best from the fewer amount of demonstration wins. Okay, so we're trying to maximize, of course, generalization, which is what we care in machine learning in general. Um, again, while previous work designed 2D policies, they were trying to reason from these multi-view images directly. Here, we're going to lift things in 3D. So we're going to take our images and featureize them with 2D backbones, like CNNs or ResNets or 2D transformers pre-trained from different tasks. And we're going to leave those features in the 3D space based on their depth, the sense depth, and there's the depth sensor. And then, uh, you know, the problem with the 3D space is that there is one more dimension, right? So, and we really need to be super accurate. This is what Antonis mentioned. We really need very, very high accuracy of where the gripper should, uh, should go. So how can we process these enormous amounts of voxels? Okay, imagine if you want to pre-chop your workspace into 3D grid cells, you will need many, many, many of those. 
Okay, so we are going to completely get rid of grid cells. We don't need grid cells. We're just going to stay with this continuous point feature representation. And what we're going to do is we're going to sample ourselves point grids, uh, course to find. So we're going to first sample a course point grid. We'll featureize it and score it, and then we'll you know predict the next one and so on. And it looks something like that. So you want to predict where your gripper is first. I sample a course. 3D feature point cloud, then I featureize it using transformers, which is something like a learnable essentially feature interpolation. You can think about it like this, um, which by the way is the most major thing that has happened in the field since 2017. Okay, we use transformers everywhere, they have incredible generalization. So you predict the focus of attention, then you featureize there, and then you featureize again. Okay, and this featureization essentially goes from at these ghost points. These points essentially is in the empty space. They attend on this lifted 3D feature cloud, featureize themselves, and we score them. All right? And, 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 and so now we need to, and, and then from there, this scoring gives you essentially where you need to put your gripper. You also take those local feature, ghost point features, and predict also how you need to orient your gripper. All right? So there is this action detection bias in this architecture that you really need to featureize and detect as opposed to regress. To XY because regression XY does not essentially generalize well. One major problem in robotics that is discussed in every conference is the fact that there are no benchmarks. And you know, while in computer vision, you know, uh, students get super frustrated unless you beat the benchmark, you cannot publish your paper. All robotics students are super happy. You know, they collect their own demos. Very few train their thing, show that you know we're better than everybody else because guess what? In our setup nobody else compares. Okay? And then we publish the paper, which is very good for researchers, but bad for I said the progress in the field. Okay? So here the Zara bench is a large scale simulation benchmark that came out in 2020, it has many, many environments, it has a programmatic way of providing demonstrations, and you need to score yourself on how well you do on those demonstrations. And what you see is <clears throat> we really, with these 3D inductive biases, we get a huge boost over the previous state of the art. So here is, uh, I mean, different researchers create their own setup of train and test splits. Here we do 10% better on this split and 22% better than the previous uh, methods in some uh, either harder split, uh, split. By harder, we mean that the test environments are further away than the training environments. So you see here our method with 10 demonstrations beats the previous method per act. Uh, from NVIDIA that uses 100 demonstrations. So what I want to show you this is the architecture matters tremendously on the amount of generalization of the model. I mean, of course, data matters. The more data, the better. Okay, the better we generalize, but architectural inductive bias also matter uh, to, 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 to do that. So things now that the robot can do are all these nice uh, simulation tasks in the arrow bench, but it can also do things in the real world. Like what you see here, with very, very few demonstrations, the robot can learn to do the right thing as what you see in the, in the tag. You may say, how does the robot know about what to do? Well, this architecture also attends to the language encoding. Okay, you take the language structure, you encode it, you also attend there. Um, so by looking at the ablations, I just want to point out that now you can change at this time where you're going to place your cameras. And that's okay. And, and as you see, the, if you reason with multi-view images and you remember where those camera views came from, you, you, your performance goes to 20%. With our model, it's still, it's still fine if you change the cameras at test time. Right? So you don't care where you're sensing the environment from, that, which is very important. Other very important details is you want to make sure your architecture is translation invariant, which means these attentions need to be relative position attentions. You should not remember the absolute location of any features. Right? The same way physics is translation invariant, you don't care where the X, Y, Z uh, center of the coordinate frame is. So you want to be able to put this type of inductive based architecture, and we do this using relative attentions. And the other thing is the fact that you weight tie, you tie the weights. You use the, shape, the same weights across uh, iterations. So here's now what the robot can do. So usually what happens with this key pose prediction, by the way, the fact that we predict key pose is not a new thing. Many previous works, instead of predicting a continuous trajectory, predict the sequence of key poses. So what you usually do, and you know, we, we, we all love, is you use a motion planner now to connect from key pose to key pose. But the truth is that motion planners fail. Motion planners fail when the trajectory they need to predict is not a straight segment, which is when you open a door or when you want to wipe the table, 
okay? You don't have, you, you need to have too many key poses if every key pose to key pose need to be connected by a straight segment. So can we throw away these motion, motion planners completely? Okay, why don't we throw away the motion planners? So, so this is what, we, because we saw that essentially each time you need to manipulate an articulated object, open a door and so on, our, our method act 3D was doing really badly due to the motion planner that had to be used to connect from key pose to key pose, and this is a failure mode also for previous works. Um, so what if we also do this in a learning based fashion? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to exploit recent advances in uh, generative models. So we'll discuss about these diffusion models now that, uh, you know, they, they really capture the output distribution. And here we're talking about distributions of trajectories. You have your language tag, you have your current configuration of the scene, you have a particular key pose you want to go to, and what you're going to do is you're going to predict a trajectory uh, to link, you know, the current key pose to the target. And the pr problem there is the multimodality. There are multiple ways that your demonstrator showed you how to go from one key pose to key pose, and if you put the regression model, it's going to fail. But guess what? Diffusion models are able to handle multimodality. And I think this is a major, major advance that happened uh, the last uh, year. So how it works is you have your trajectories, and essentially you add noise. And I think Alex is going to talk more about this type of models in the, in the later session. To Hello? Yeah, the green thing. Okay, and uh, the diffusion model essentially learns to undo the noise, all right? So if you do that, and then you put this type of learnable uh, trajectory predictor, right? So now there is no hand design motion planner in the architecture at all. You are able to do this uh, complicated articulate trajectory segments uh, and do well in a particular set of tasks that actually you had problem on. So how can we scale up? Uh, a huge, uh, you know, many, many successes of AI the last uh, five years and ten years came from scaling up the data. F with robots, this is very hard to do. We don't have robots in our daily world collecting, uh, you know, data, and that would have been pretty, to be honest, as a safe. So, so what can we do? I mean, of course, the golden thing to do would be to learn with little data, to actually solve the problem of how the human brain learns with very little data, and we do the same. But, but I can tell you, having a five-year-old, they actually get a lot of data themselves. I mean, it has been very difficult to explain, you know, two plus three, or how to pick a particular two. Humans do spend a lot of time in the early years of life, and we all have forgotten about that, but this was months of practice when we were little, okay? So we do need to scale up. So how can we scale up? This is an open problem, we do not know. Some people like simulations, some people like the real world. One thing that we have invested on is building better simulators. We have good simulators of simulating rigid bodies, but what about gas, what about fluids, what about you know, soft objects, what about cutting cheese and so on. So my student here, Zian Zhu, he's very excited, he's been pushing this simulator, this was a, again a recent 2023 paper, he's still working on scaling this up, making open it open, publicly available, while many simulators from companies, you know, are not always uh, publicly available. And guess what? Now you can simulate better fluids and gases. And then you're going to say, great, who is going to make those 3D models for me? Do I need to hire now a designer, right, to, to make a simulation environment? It doesn't sound very easy. And indeed, this is exactly the problem. Scaling up simulation is very, very difficult because you need designers to build those assets for you. So let's go back to, 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 the, to the revolutions of 2023. One insane thing that happened this year is 2D to 3D uh, lifting. Uh, the revolution on taking an image and lifting it into a 3D model. Okay? And, and this is from a single viewpoint. You, you just take one image and you predict it's 3D. And, and you know what? You can also ask a large language model. I see a ducky. What is its average size? And the large language model is going to tell you. And it's also going to tell you how heavy it is. So you are ready now to insert it in your simulator. Um, so here is Dali and Imogen that you may have heard about, that condition and text they are trained to generate images. And the images look incredible, and the reasoning that these models can do is also kind of incredible. So for example, you can tell them, make a selfie, I'm taking a selfie in the French Revolution, and they're going to show that image, which they've never seen in the training set. And here, uh, you know, is a set of 3D assets that we built by lifting single images to 3D. And these are all about food, and it's very hard to find those 3D assets because designers have not built them. And I'm kind of excited. We have a project with Sony 
you know, a company that cares a lot about home robots and manipulation of food and gastronomy and, you know, sh robot chefs. And we've been producing them a simulator of food for like four years. And we never, we never had the resources to actually build it, but guess what? Now with generative models, we can actually go ahead and do that and build, uh, and in combination with us, you know, building better simulators and those automating these asset creation, we can generate environments of plates with pieces of avocado and, you know, tofu pieces and so on and so forth. So because I don't have uh, time, unfortunately, I don't have... Uh, you know, be able to explain to you how, how this works, but I will love it. It's super simple. Essentially, you just take your, the rendering, instead of doing the projection with what you see, you essentially get the feedback from the, from the generative model, how likely is the image of your 3D model generated under the distribution they have learned. You see, you'll have your, you know, differentiable 3D function of the 3D asset, you render it and you ask the generative model, is this likely? Have you seen this? A training time. Essentially, this is how roughly it works. Now, okay, so unfortunately having uh, five minutes left, I cannot discuss about LLMs, so I want to go directly to the open problems, all right? Um, <clears throat> so, so here is two things that I think are open and I'm super excited about. One is going back to perception as analysis by synthesis, and the other is about learning world models, general possible world models that can generalize across domains. So the first is the natural question that we've been asking very, very long time. We have beautiful image generation. Everybody talks about the beautiful generated images that came out in 2022 and 2023. How will this impact computer vision? We, we organized a workshop in ECCV a couple of years ago exactly about this question. And there was a workshop in this CVPR 2023 exactly on the same topic. Giant models look wonderful. How will this change discriminative tasks? How can we detect objects better, do more fine-grained perception, and so on? So this is not clear. Alan really was in that workshop, and he gave a talk on analysis by synthesis. He has been talking about this for a very long time. Essentially, what this means is you want to sample from your priors of 3D scenes and keep the explanation that better aligns with the 2D image that you get. So we are also very excited about this. We've been trying to do this segmentation by essentially rendering back the, the inferred segments back to the image and, and you know getting feedback. But but this is nowhere to be nowhere close. But but I do believe now that the, the evolution of generative models we should revisit this question and solve perception in a completely different way than just labeling pixels. Now the second is the most important thing. Here is Kenneth Crook, a philosopher that died at 31 from, he had a, an accident, unfortunately, that talked about the importance of mental models. H how humans can act intelligently because they have a mental uh, model of the world. They can learn to play video games very, very fast. Why? Because they know what monster is. They know where they can step on this, uh, you know, on the left. They know to avoid the fire. Well, if you change for them the pictures, and you ask them to play, they're going to take a very long time. And many of them give up. They say, I'm too tired. Okay, they don't even want to play when the priors don't go through. I know it doesn't matter. Today's reinforcement learning st starts from scratch, tries to build a model in a domain, tries to solve this domain, then you change the domain, the model doesn't work anymore, and so on. So the question is, how can we build general purpose? And this general purpose nowadays has this term foundational. Uh, world models, okay, of how, of models of how the world work, that will be able to use uh, for reinforcement learning, along with imitation learning and learning from demonstrations to actually, you know, build robot agents that can learn autonomously across uh, environments. And, and this is at the end of my talk. Thank you. Let's take one or two questions. So, um, I think it would be, I mean, the, the problems that we are playing with are wonderful. I think it would be very interesting to take much more control of math problems like molecules as Lydia plays with, or, you know, solving partial differential equations and use these tools there where you can generate new stuff, you can guide the generation of new stuff, resample it. it there's, there's places in traditional physics where there are generative models, like umbrella sampling, for example, will generate confirmation. So you can take and couple data-driven, database-driven generations, uh, and you can use them to guide physics-based generations. In, in a way, you're doing this. I'm just thinking that it would be good to do it on math problems first, that are easier, 
than the real problems that you're working with. Yes, uh, and indeed, uh, you're absolutely correct. So now the two interesting things here is for molecule generation or protein generation, this is exactly recent 2023, I have seen papers that, that do this type of generation much better with those diffusion modes, which I think it's incredible. And the other amazing thing, which I found super, uh, you know, inspiring is this alpha fold, the paper that brought a revolution to biology of, of figuring out how the proteins fold actually uses 3D inductive biases. Uh, you know, there's no magic there, it's just that the DeepMind team really built an architecture that can learn from few data by doing 3D inductive bias as the first part of the work. So you are absolutely correct. But, but you, know, you know, we are excited about images, that, that's the problem, right? Yes. Yes, so I haven't done any work. This is called image forensics. You want to figure out where the image came from? Yeah. Excited about this um, problem? Uh, I, I cannot. Uh, I cannot say something because it's not. I haven't. I, I checked. Yes. Yes. To physics. Mm -hmm. So this uh, um, projection happens because you know the camera equation, so you know how the 3D coordinates map to the 2D coordinates. Uh, I imagine video perception, unfortunately I, I haven't done any work, but I believe video perception should solve exactly what you're saying. So you have 2D and then you have a latent 3D which you don't observe, but you can try to infer it because you know the projection. Um, we have models now that, that can do that, that they can solve in those problems and, and learn a distribution over the latent factors without ever seeing them simply by looking up the uh, renders. You may say, but we did that before. Yes, we did that before. The only new thing now is that we can capture multi-modality over those latents with those diffusion models. While before, you, you know, we, we couldn't capture the full distribution. I would love to discuss about this on the break. Okay, let's take... Uh and we move to the third speaker of uh, this session, uh, Georgia uh, Gyokhari. Uh, she is Assistant uh, Professor in Computing and Mathematical Sciences at Caltech. She obtained her PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from UC Berkeley. Uh, uh, and prior to that, she, was, uh, um, she obtained her diploma from the National Technical University of Athens. Um, uh, um, Georgia has received a number of awards. Uh, let me uh, mention the PAMI Young Researcher Award, which recognizes a young researcher for their distinguished research uh, contributions to computer vision, the PAMI Mark uh, Evergram Award for open source software, and uh, uh, also the MAR Prize for Mask RNN published and presented at ICCV. Georgia. Thank you. Hi everyone, so um, Calvera. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, this is the first talk that I ever give in Greece about my work, so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I want to talk today about my work on advancing machine perception. I think a lot of it has been introduced and motivated by Katerina and Adonis in the last two sessions, um, but I kind of want to dwell in, see where we are and what there is to solve moving forward. This is also going to be a very much inspired 2023 talk. We just came back from CVPR where everybody was in a crisis mode almost. And I kind of want to debunk this and give a very, um, my view of where things are and uh, where all these new advances of AI will, can lead us. Um, so first, I want to take the time to introduce myself a little bit, um, mostly because I guess it is my first time giving a talk here. So I wanted to uh, tell you about me a little bit. So um, I, I did my undergrad here at CIMI, at Polisopolitechnio. 
uh, from 2005 to 2010. And then I went on halfway across the globe to UC Berkeley to get my PhD with Jitendra Malik. Um, and the last year of my PhD, I decided to intern at Google Brain, Google Research, just to see how some of our work is being applied in industry setting. And I guess I was very excited by that because then I joined Meta for six years where I was a research scientist doing uh, cool, innovative research work for six years until, until last year where I decided that um, I'd rather be a poor academic and, I, and to move to Caltech to pursue more open-ended problems in the space of tech, but also the sciences. Um, so I've been working through all of these years in the problem of mas machine perception. And um, what is that? I know it's been covered by Adonis and also by Katarina, but I will repeat it just for context. So um, I'm showing you this image right here. Um, and this is going to be now a testament of how brilliant all of you are. So this image, you have never been in this scene. You don't know what this is. You don't know what these people are. And yet, you're able to understand exactly what is going on. Uh, you see that there's three people. One is walking away, carrying three bags. The other one is talking. The middle one is talking to this person in a, up on the right that is sitting on a bench, playing an accordion. They're probably talking. You also can infer that this is a street scene, and so on. And you can also tell more other things about this scene. You can tell about maybe the, how the, the, the shapes are in 3D space. This is all from looking at this one image. So the question now that I am trying to solve and a lot of us are trying to solve is how can we make machines see exactly the same thing like you just did? And while this is a hard problem, it's a very easy problem for you. We don't know exactly why it is an easy problem for you. Evolution has a lot to do with it, but for machines, it's a very hard problem because all this is to a machine is an array of numbers. So now what we have to take is this array of numbers and get to these very high-level semantic concepts about what's occurring in the scene. And this is why the problem is hard, but it's easy for you, it's hard for machines. And so the first task here that has been the pinnacle of computer vision and recognition for a while is, uh, is object understanding. So take an image and be able to build a machine that can not only tell what objects there are in this image, but also precisely localize them. And there's been, there's been a lot of work here for almost 20, 30 years, going back to uh, Fischler and Viola and Jones face detector and such. Um, and briefly, I wanted to describe this work that I have done with my colleagues at Meta. It's called Masker CNN, which proposes a solution to this problem. And even though this is a this paper was presented in 2017, so it's uh, six years old. It's still ubiquitous because it's a meta architecture. It admits all the recent advances that we're seeing today in neural network design. So what does Mask RCN do? So it's a neural network, and in particular, it's a convolutional neural network. Um, and it consists of two parts. The first part takes the image and embeds it into a feature map. This is this uh, higher dimensional uh, map that uh, is easier to do recognition with. This part also what it does, it's supposed to tell you how, where objects are. So it's supposed to discover these regions of interest that the model thinks that objects are in the image. And then comes the second part, which is the region-wide reasoning. So here you take uh, the feature representations that belong to these regions, the regions that the model thinks that the it, uh, objects are occupied with, and it's supposed to address tasks. In this case, it's going to be localization with a silhouette. It can be pose. It can be 3D that we'll see in, in a few slides. And the critical component here is the one that transitions from the first part, the image-wide part, to the region-wide part. And I know there, there's a lot of mysticism about designing neural network and how scientific it is, and it's actually quite challenging. And this is the part that, innovate, that we innovated in Mascar CNN, where we had to really think deeply about the properties of invariance and equivariance in order to get to this very good performance. And in addition to this, of course, comes the recipe. Um, Mascar CNN, as all modern technology, works with getting, designing a neural network, and then training it on a lot of data. Uh, how lot that data is, uh, right now we're seeing trillions uh, and billions of uh, data points in our data sets that, we, that are required for us to train these big models. So this, this, this recipe, model and data, is a very, very powerful one. 
And of course, the goal here is not to just build a model that works in one specific case or in one specific domain, but actually build perception systems that work in the wild. Uh, I know there has been a lot of talk about synthetic or real world, but my thesis is that building systems that work in the real world is the, the challenging and the ultimate goal of all computer vision. And so uh, this model showed, uh, showed that it could, it could handle out of very diverse distribution of data, like this uh, image of the surfers right here. Uh, this is also featured in Richard Zaliski's second edition of the computer vision book. And it also could be extended to work on uh, videos. Uh, here is, I'm sorry, it's actually not extended. This is actually just applied frame by frame. Um, and you just see how well the method works, but without doing any temporal smoothing. And of course, and this is where the extensions come in, you can extend it to do a lot more complicated tasks. You can extend it to do human object interactions. And here you can also extend it for videos to do tracking where you are supposed to track the objects over time. Um, and all this is available for you to play with, uh, open source with the Detection 2 library. Okay, so um, this is all very still important research. Uh, we're still playing with the same models. We're still advancing the same tasks. Uh, but right now, we're in the era of these large language models. We have these, the capabilities of models like GPT and ChatGPT that are able to have actual conversations with you in free form text. And this is a very exciting, exciting time to be doing research in AI. Uh, these are capabilities that, to be frank, we quite didn't expect that they would come this soon and so well. Um, and from a computer vision perspective, what we're trying to understand is how, when these models are fused, these large language model capabilities are fused with computer vision, what it is that they can do. Uh, there's a lot of hypotheses about reasoning about AGI, artificial general intelligence, and whether that's possible. And um, this is sort of what I want to talk about today. And I want to start by giving you a few uh, examples of what the marriage of large language models and computer vision can do. And in particular, I've been playing with this model that's the uh, Flamingo model. It was developed by DeepMind and re-implemented by uh, folks at Lyon, which marries uh, the recent uh, lang huge large language models from Llama with uh, very strong vision, vision models, the latest VATs, into trying to describe images. And this is an example of an image right here. I tried, this is from a personal collection. It's definitely not on the internet, so it's not, it was not, it was not trained. This is my student at Caltech. Um, she's wearing this thing. I don't know how many of you know what, this, what she's, how many know what she's wearing? Okay, a few of you. Let's see if the model knows. So I asked Flamingo, um, what is this? And Flamingo says, a woman wearing an EEG headset. I think that's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive that it was able to recognize it. It describes the whole image, but it describes it very well. It is indeed a woman, and she's wearing indeed an EEG headset. Um, so they're great at, at giving captions of images. They're great at describing images, just like Maskerson is also great at, at recognizing objects. But let's see if they can actually reason, which is the hypothesis and the excitement that we see on Twitter and all these reporters that are contacting us about whether we are humanity is at risk. So here's another example. Uh, this is actually a very common image. Um, there was an incident in Dublin with an airport that was closing or something. So there's an image there. So this was definitely part of the training set. I just wanted to make it very easy for the model. And I ask it, what is this? Flamingo says, the departure board at an airport. That's correct. Which way is gate 413? I asked the model. Um, Flamingo says, gate 413 is to the right. Okay, not quite. Actually, gate 413 is straight and slightly to the left, perhaps. Uh, and then I ask it, okay, well, can you tell me which gates are straight ahead? And Flamingo says, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the whole American alphabet. Okay, uh, not quite correct. We don't have AGI. You are not at risk. Hold your horses, okay? Um, and, okay, I am being a little bit facetious here. I'm being a little bit, trying to be a little sneaky, a little uh, spicy. But just to say that 
These models are great at what they are trained to do, which is describe and understand high-level images and the, scene, the scenery type, but they're very not good at reasoning. And what they're especially not very good at is spatial reasoning. And now I'm going back to exactly describing what and discussing what Caterina and others were talking about, and especially in 3D reasoning. So a lot of the useful applications that we want to build in the real world is understand not only what scenes we see, not only what objects we see in images, but also understand how these objects are laid out in 3D space. I don't, I don't want just to know that this is a traffic scene, a street scene, and there's a bunch of cars, a policeman, a stop sign, or whatever, but I also want to understand how these objects are laid out in 3D. I also want to know the properties of the objects. How big are they? How far are they from the camera or from each other? These are the important reasoning tasks that we want to be able to solve with AI, which will lead to a lot of exciting applications. Katerina talked about robotics, self-driving cars, assistive technology, and so forth. Uh, and this is something that we're very far from being able to do right now with all the recent techniques. Actually, there, I'm going to claim that there isn't really a good solution that works in the wild for all types of scenes and many, many types of objects. And so this is what I want to call the next generation of AI systems, is are the ones that are going to have advanced spatial reasoning. So how, we're going to, how can we go from any image source, from any, any the web in this case, actually an image download to the web, and apply a computer vision model that's able to detect these objects in 3D. And now these objects are no longer labeled in pixel space. They actually live in this continuous 3D space that you can view from many angles and understand the spatial layout. And this is an intricate task, not just because scenes are so complex and contain so many objects, but also they have, because they have these very unique shapes and geometries. Um, and how can we infer these geometries is also a very interesting problem. Again, Katerina Donis talked about these, but here's, for example, Mark Zuckerberg's favorite toy has been trying to push this on us for a while. This is a headset, an Oculus headset. Um, not, not, nothing like this exists, nothing like this. There isn't a shape that's uh, common uh, for us to train with, but we would like for our models to be able to infer the shape regardless. And how to do this is something that I'm very excited about and I've been trying to push with recent perception models. And so for the last three years of my career, I've been trying to think how you can push perception models to work in the real world, in 3D, for a variety and diverse objects and scenes. And so one of these projects that we presented at this uh, passive APR a few weeks ago uh, was this idea of taking an images and being able to understand their 3D objects and layouts. And we wanted to take a very different approach than prior work, which focused either exclusively on self-driving cars or exclusively on very, um, on very rudimentary basic indoor examples. So we proposed this data set that is a diverse data set of over 3 million objects, 200,000 images of all of more than 90 object types that will be able to solve this task. And we developed this approach that was trained on this large, larger than any other data set, data set um, and actually was able to beat all other approaches that were designed on single domains, but also on this bigger data set. And more excitedly, it is able to work also on images that are sourced randomly from the web. So no longer specialized solutions for specific domains, but working in the wild and for many domain objects. And here are some results from some random images. So you see on the left image, the prediction superimposed on the, on the middle, and a top view. You always need to have a top view for 3D so that you can actually understand what the model is predicting. And what you see here, the tile is actually one meter across one meter tile so that you can actually see the metric, the, the, how big the scene is, which is part of what the model needs to predict. Again, another scene. Um, some self-driving car scenes to make the self-driving community happy, otherwise they, they nag you during reviewing. But more excitedly, from random images, images that we just collect from the web that are not part of the training distribution. Okay, uh, the second is uh, this idea of lifting single view, single view objects to 3D. These are objects that are out of distribution that we've never seen before, like Spyro. Um, if you're a PlayStation fan and were born in the 80s, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
So uh, this is something that we did with, uh, with uh, ideas from recent ideas from, so from self-supervised learning and also using transformer-based architectures that are able to capture long-range interactions uh, in image and geometry. So you have these two modalities, bring them together with transformers, and you're now able to lift objects uh, to 3D. So for example, this backpack, uh, what I'm showing you here is what a LiDAR sensor or a depth sensor would able to get uh, to reconstruct the object, which you see is sparse and not very good and noisy. And what you see here is our reconstruction. Spyro, I'm a big PlayStation fan, so I like Spyro. Um, the headset, we've seen this. Um, a plane, this is a common object. And these are actually uh, all captured with our iPhone. So we went around our home, I, we have our iPhones, and we capture objects from, from our collection. And it also works with completely different objects, like from DALI to generated ones. I think we prompted here the model with a marshmallow in the shape of a cat with a mustache. So this is the image that we get on the left, and we can see its reconstruction on the right. Um, in addition to this, I've also been uh, really thinking about new optimization schemes for uh, lifting, for uh, taking sparse views, a test time, this test time optimization. So you take views, there's no generalization here, and you lift them to 3D. But what I'm very most excited about um, is this idea of analysis by synthesis that Katerina talked about, is devising self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning approaches where you don't have any 3D supervision, you only learn from video data, and you're able to reconstruct scenes. So this project that was presented last year, um, we're able to tackle this problem of 3D understanding of shape and layouts, learning only from video data of very complex scenes and a variety of objects, doing this analysis by synthesis. So we're fusing here advances from perception, from differentiable rendering, and from, um, from uh, specific attributes, equivalence, and invariance properties in the network to be able to learn 3D from purely analysis by synthesis. Um, and, you know, I've been saying all this time how this is a challenging task, going from images to 3D, um, and it really was. And when I was starting to work on this, this direction, I very quickly realized that there is actually no tools that will facilitate learning 3D in deep learning. And so all of this research was made possible by first going and building this PyTorch 3D library. Um, this is a library specifically for 3D deep learning that marries and actually very nicely uh, fuses with PyTorch with this, this with this general 3D deep learning library that is most commonly used for 1D or 2D data like text and images. And this gives you now modular and efficient operations for 3D deep learning. So if you're interested in working in this space, this is a good starting point working with with um, with libraries in PyTorch and PyTorch 3D. Um, and I want to conclude my talk by saying why I'm excited about spatial reasoning. And why I'm going to be insisting on working in this, I worked on this at Meta and will keep working in this at Caltech. I'm excited about it because of the potential applications. We care about creating physical AI system, and we care about building technology that actually works humans rather than try to sell things to humans. So um, I, and to make this happen, to, to be able to venture into these applications, it, we really need to be able to make things systems work that work well, robust and in the wild. And I wanted to stretch test some of the, the, the models that we have built into seeing how well they could actually work in such applications. And so uh, I wanted to see how well our model that does 3D object detection would work in a video like this. So this is a video captured by a person wearing this uh, nerdy looking headset. This is an augmented reality headset that Meta, this, uh, this research organization at Meta is building. It's actually a fantastic piece of hardware. It has two uh, black and white cameras, one RGB camera, seven microphones, IMUs. And so what you see on the, on the right is a person that's walking around in this space wearing this headset. And this is a completely different domain. First of all, you have these viewpoint changes that you don't have in static images. Um, you also have motion, a lot of motion blur, and also a lot of objects moving constantly to the right and to the left in the margins of the images, rather than being center-centric, which is a lot of the distributions that we see in static images. And so we applied this model on this, on, this, on this capture just to see how well it could actually predict the scene. 
And you see, nothing is solved, nothing is perfect, we're far from a solution, but at least this is trying to do something and trying to reason into this space. So to summarize, uh, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm between you and coffee right now, just one more slide. Um, Current AI solutions have very basic perception skills. Yes, perception is largely solved, but what perception? The very basic ones. We're able to say what kind of scene this is. We're able maybe to localize a few objects with their silhouettes, and that's about it. We haven't solved much of the more complex and much of the more exciting perception capabilities that we want to be able to solve. Uh, which, ha with regard to spatial reasoning and 3D spatial reasoning, I think that's going to be the next milestone to conquer. And now. What are the solutions going to look like? Are LLMs uh, going to be helpful toward the school? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, are other multimodal foundation models, perhaps? Maybe diffusion generative models, because I talked about how these can help in perception to close the loop. Um, there's a lot of things left to do. So if you think that AI is solved and we're doomed, I just want to tell you this is definitely not the case. Uh, we're very far from a solution. And right now is the most exciting time to be working in this space because of all these great tools that we've built and all these great advances that could help bring all of these, two, all of these modules together to get to new, new uh, results. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you and happy to take any questions. Okay, one or two questions again. Yes. Hi, thank you for the nice talk. Um, it's interesting that uh, something doesn't work with large language models. Uh, could you give us uh, some ideas about why it doesn't work? So, what, what makes Okay, so the question is, what does, spatial re what does language do well and not, and why is spatial reasoning not something that language does? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to give a answer, and that is, I think, language, if, if, and if you see how we communicate, we never communicate about spatial reasoning with language. We communicate with language, we're trying to propagate very compact information about the semantic contents of what we're seeing, of what we're experiencing. So it does make sense that it does understand to class to I recognize the EEG headset, but it doesn't understand about anything spatially and how objects are arranged. Uh, I, saw, I, t I gave you the example of grounding to see what gates there are. This is definitely not something that you would use language to communicate with, even though you as a person can solve. So language is a very, very powerful tool. It's complementary modality to vision, but it's not infinite in its capabilities to describe and understand the world. It does a few things very well, but not everything. Does that cover it? OK. Okay, one more question. Well, maybe this is a, a, a naive question, but I was wondering, and this is coming from the uh, previous two talks, and yours too, to computer vision, can you infer uh, physical attributes of the objects, uh, like physical properties? Mm -hmm. Can you, through computer vision, uh, compute the viscosity of it, or the density of it? Are you saying whether it could or sh should or would? Okay, uh, I think that currently it pro so uh, the short answer is that current solutions cannot do that well. Maybe in some under some very constraints and some specific objects and uh, under some simulated design they could, but we don't have comprehensive solution for this. Should it? Absolutely. We should be able to solve any computer vision, any task that could be inferred through through vision visual data. It should be able. We should be able to solve it. All right, thank you very much. Okay, we've come to the end of the first session. We have a 15 minute break in front of us. I'm sorry? 11. 11 minutes break. Let's thank all the speakers. Oh, okay. So, I'm sorry, I got confused. We'll be back at 11, so we have a longer break. Okay, let's thank all the speakers.